Jesus is about to ascend back to heaven to be with his father, to sit at his right hand. And before he does that, he tells the people, he tells his apostles, he says, look, you're going to go and you're going to tell people about me. You're going to take the good news, the gospel to people. And you're going to start here in Jerusalem. And then Jesus says, it's not just going to stay in your immediate family or friend group, but no, it has to go beyond that. And then you're going to go to the rest of the world. Good morning. Welcome to Marlboro Christian Church. My name is Ed Carter. I'm one of the ministers on staff here. How are we doing? Woo, good. How did you guys enjoy the uh, Back to Church video? It's pretty good watching all those. It was great last weekend because for me, uh, there's probably 200 people out there. But out of that 200, probably 75 to 100 were under the age of 18, which really gets me excited. It was really awesome to see all of those kids. I know at one point um, I looked at the playground and I tried to get a count and I think I counted about 48. So there's probably 48 fifth grade and under, which was really kind of a cool thing to see. Um, There's a passage of scripture in uh, Mark chapter uh, four. And I just want to share with you real quick. He said, says that Jesus said the kingdom of God is as if a man should uh, scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. talks about the kingdom of God is like a farm, you know, and I just want you to picture a farmer that... uh, goes out or a guy that wants to become a farmer. And so he decides, and he doesn't know a lot about farming, but he decides he's just going to buy like 250 um, acres of land and decides I'm going to become a farmer. And so what do you need to become a farmer? You need tractors. So he goes out and he buys tractors. What else do you need to become a farmer? You know, he, he buys all of the different equipment needed and necessary to become a farmer. And one day he says, I am now a farmer. And he says, now I just got to wait for my crops to grow. And so he sits on his front porch and day one, he watches and nothing happens. And then day two, he watches and nothing happens. And day after day after day, he watches and he gets a little bit more unsettled, a little uneasy, maybe even a little bit angry. And he begins to pray, God, just make something grow. So he gets to the point of desperation and he goes to the farm down the street and he says, Hey, I've got this farm. I've bought all this equipment. And nothing's growing in my fields. And the farmer says, well, what have you planted? He said, planted? What do you mean? He said, well, you have to put the seed down. And see, oftentimes, I think sometimes in church world, we forget that we have to plant seeds. That we have to tell people the good news in order for the gospel to go, for the kingdom of God to move forward. One of the great things that happened early in my ministry here at Marlboro Christian Church is we didn't have a lot of money. So creativity was at the, you know, creativity was high. But even though we didn't have much money, I can remember going into elders meetings and there was one particular elder, his name was Cliff Schweitzer, and Cliff watches online right now. And uh, Cliff, if you're watching, I can't say how much I love you. But he would come into every one of our meetings, and he knew exactly where all of our financials were. And he would be like, okay, we got we to be paying attention. We got to be paying attention to this, and we got to be paying attention to that. And he was 100% correct, and he understood. And, and, and then it would be my turn to talk about youth programming and things like that. And I'd be like, well, I think I want to spend some money. And it was always interesting to watch Cliff because he was always torn, right, in that moment for about 30 seconds about like, is this financially responsible for us to be spending money or should we spend money on kids? And like a good grandfather, he's like, we're going to spend the money on the kids. And Cliff, time after time after time, just showed the willingness to invest in the next generation over and over and over again. He said, I'm going to plant the seeds that it takes. And here's what, what's come of that. We've always had a great youth program, or at least the ability to have one. We've always invested into the lives of the next generation. Sometimes maybe we've even made some mistakes But we had the ability to do that. And here's what I know as a a church leader, not just here at Marlboro Christian Church, but talking with church leaders in our community 
and even outside of our community is that there are many, many churches that are dying. Many churches that are dying. Many churches that the average age is over 60, 65 years old. And the future is not well for them. We, we support two church camps. We support Round Lake and we support Elkhorn. Elkhorn Valley, I was talking to the camp manager not too long ago. The majority of their churches that support them do not have hardly any children in them. So when I get to go out like last Sunday and see, you know, 50 elementary kids and another 50 other kids running around, I, it just like lights me up gets me excited. And then you transition that to I get to preach on the book of Acts for the next nine weeks. Now it's just going to be exciting. But here's the reality. Youth ministry is not cheap. It's not cheap. We invest heavily into the lives of our students. And that is financially uh, something that we do. And so I want to thank everyone in the room, online, thank First Service for the people that do invest here at Marlboro Christian Church that are planting financial seeds for our next generation. I thank you as a father, but I thank you as, our, as a senior minister, and I thank you as just a friend to say thank you for that investment because it matters, and it really, really matters. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you want to get involved in giving, you can give in the back. You can give online. If you're watching, there's a give button. You can go to marlborochristian.com, click the give button, however you want to invest. But I just want you to know that we value you and we value the children of this church and of this community. Speaking of this community, we just began um, last year, we fed just about 300 students a week through Marlington Local Schools Elementary Schools. This year, that number is up to 355. And so we're going to continue to do that every Friday. Food will go out to those students through us and three other supporting churches in this community. And we're excited about that. And uh, you should be excited that we get to do that as well. So transitioning is not always easy, but that's what we're going to do. I'm a dreamer. I like big, big dreams. Any other dreamers in the room? Like you, you see more what can be than maybe what is. Anybody else like that? She's like, I do. That's me. Dreaming is fun for me. Uh, I love thinking about things that, to be a part of that are bigger than me. I, th I think that's why I love athletics so much. Athletics for uh, team sports, football, soccer, baseball, basketball, um, all of those team sports. Like there's just a camaraderie that's built. There's relationships. And when you're on a good team, and I don't mean that just wins and losses good, but like a good group of people that work together, that sacrifice for each other, that push the ball forward in ways there's nothing like it. It's why I believe that so many people, when they look at the best days of their lives, it's before the age of 18 or 19. And they look back on their high school, middle school days where they were on some part of a team and they just loved that. And, and, and there's just something about it. I think that's why, why so many people like to be entrepreneurs to start something. Like there's that adventure at the beginning. Like I wanna get this company up and running. I wanna get this nonprofit up and running. And there's just an energy to the start. And sometimes the management of something can kind of feel, well, underwhelming. Like a lot of times when you listen to, to people who have started great uh, organizations, either in the business world, nonprofit, or churches, they'll talk to you at length of the, the early days, the start. You know, if you listen to Silicon Valley, you hear the stories of Google, of Apple, of Microsoft, of IBM, do you know that all of them in their origin story start in a garage? How cool is that? Like it came out of this like part of their house and it's just so organic, organic and, and they tell those stories, but they don't very often tell the stories of the day-to-day -day now that they're these multi-billion dollar organizations. There's an energy in the buildup. And, and, and oftentimes they talk about this unstoppableness of the organization early on. And so what's cool about the book of Acts that we're going to be looking at is there's this energy to it. There's this beginning of the church energy. 
And so Acts, the book of Acts, is written by a man named Luke. He also wrote the book of Luke and their companion books. And so the book of Luke tells the story of Jesus' life. And then it transitions to the acts of the apostles or the beginning of the church. And and he writes it uh, to a guy named Theophilus, which we'll get to that. But I think I want to start this series with Matthew chapter 28 and starting in verse 18. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. And so Jesus is at the end of his time with the disciples, and he gives them this challenge, this commission, this goal. And we as Marlboro Christian Church have taken that passage of scripture and we've made it our vision that we are a church that makes disciples who make disciples who makes disciples. Like that's our vision. That's our our goal. That's our ultimate measuring stick is how many disciples are we making? Are people looking more and more like Jesus today than they did yesterday? That's the the goal. And so in Acts, you're going to see the beginning of the church. And so in Acts chapter one, verse one, it says, to my, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven. And after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Theophilus in Greek means God lover. And so Luke is writing this book as an account of how the early church began and what the apostles we're doing. Some believe that Theophilus was the benefactor of Luke who funded this. Uh, others believe that he was a slave to Theophilus who, because Luke was a physician, he was a doctor, he nursed Theophilus back to health and then gave him the means to travel and become a, a travel companion of Paul. He's not a Jew. He, he is a, a Roman citizen And he did not actually walk with Jesus, but did an investigation of people who were actually with Jesus and saw him and heard him. And so that's a little bit of background on um, Luke. And so if we continue uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, After Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And so here what what, uh, Luke is letting us know is that Jesus, after he had died and been resurrected, he appeared to people for 40 days. He wasn't hidden away. He was walking around among people. And he says that on one of those occasions when Jesus, the resurrected Christ, uh, was out, he was eating with people and he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is appearing to people, he's showing himself to people, and he's talking to his apostles and he says to them, wait here, something big is coming. And we're going to get to that um, later. And he says, something big is going to happen. And they gathered around Jesus in verse 6, and, and, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And the disciples are still thinking that Jesus is going to lead some sort of revolution that makes Israel rise up and become a powerful earthly nation. And Jesus responds to them by saying, it is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before his very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And so in this passage of scripture, what's taking place is Jesus is about to ascend back to heaven to be with his father, to sit at his right hand. And before he does that, he tells the people, he tells his apostles, he says, look, you're going to go and you're going to tell people about me. You're going to take the good news, the gospel to people. And you're going to start here in Jerusalem. And then you're going to go to Judea, which was the area that Jerusalem was in. And then you're going to go to Samaria. And then you're going to go to the rest of the world. 
He said that's going to be the process that the gospel, the good news, the church is going to begin and then spread. See, the purpose of the gospel, the good news, is for us to be reunited with God. But it's not something that's meant to be kept in a small little holy huddle. It's meant to spread. It's meant to get out. It's meant to go. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 28, go and make disciples. It's why he's telling the apostles here, look, it's not just going to stay here in this small community of Jerusalem, but it's going to go out further and further and further. And so that's what we kind of want to land today is how do we contextualize that here and in the now? Because see, what we're going to watch in the book of Acts is chapters one through seven deal with the good news, the gospel being spread in Jerusalem. And then chapters 8 and 9 talk about how the church and the gospel go to Judea and Samaria. And then 10 through 28 talks about it going to the ends of the earth. But it doesn't end there. It continues today. We are a part of this church spreading to the ends of the earth. This good news. So I don't know. How many of you guys have... How many of you did not grow up in church? Like maybe you... You didn't enter church world until you were a teenager or older. Anybody in the room? Okay, there's a few of us. We're like a club. Like, there are things that happen to the four or five of us that some people that have been in church their whole lives will not understand. So, like, when I first started going to church, I was probably in the fourth or fifth grade. I first started paying attention in church when I was a sophomore, probably. So there was a few years where I, like, I went, but I really went. And here's what I really quickly began to understand. There's a whole secret like language in church world, like sanctification. Like no one uses sanctification anywhere but at church. And so if you don't know what that means and you're sitting out in the audience, you hear that and you just zone out. You're like, okay, I don't know what that means. I don't get it. And there are certain things that you are expected to know, like King David. Like, who is King David? Like, you're sitting out there. But I'll never forget the first time that I heard the story of Noah and the Ark. I had seen it on, you know, on walls. I'd seen pictures of it. It was always really cute. I'd heard the, the, the you know, the two-by-two two songs and all of that. But to actually sit down and read the story, here's what jumped out at me as probably a sophomore in high school at Elkhorn Valley Christian Service Camp reading this story for the first time, really hearing it and reading it for the first time. Wow, did a lot of people die. Like everyone died. Like that's what stuck out for me. I, I, and then as I got older and as the story, like I, I, you know, as when I first started preaching, I, I remember saying like, when we have the, the pictures on the walls in our, we don't have the dead bodies floating. Like, but that's the real picture of Noah's Ark. It's not a children's story. It's a story of the warning of God's wrath on a world that will not repent. Like, that's the story of, of Noah's Ark. And we've made it the story of building a zoo. Right? Like, that's what we've turned it into. But when I first started coming to church, I read it for the first time. And when I read the story of David and Goliath for the first time, I didn't see Facing the Giants, a football movie. What I saw was King or a young David killing a giant and then cutting his head off and keeping the head as a souvenir. Like, that's what stood out to me. I was like, wow, this is a very violent story. But the first story that I ever heard of King David, this mighty King David, man after God's own heart, was the story of Bathsheba. How this man after God's own heart was cheating with a woman who was married to a military figure in his own army. Like, and so oftentimes we don't always do the best job of defining terms for people. And so if you're new to the church and you hear the term good news or gospel and you're like, I kind of understand, but I don't know. I'm going to give you a working definition, not all the details, but a working definition so that you kind of understand the good news. The good news begins with bad news. The bad news is this. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God and we all deserve hell. And because of our sin, and sin is when we miss the mark in the way that God wants us to live. See, God wants us to live a righteous, pure, and holy life. But we, because of our nature, 
have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve hell and death. That's the bad news. The good news is that John 3.16 says that God sent his one and only son to die, to make a way for us to be reconnected with him as we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And so we enter into a relationship with Jesus based on the, uh, on the understanding that he is our king, he is our Lord, he is our Messiah, and then we in turn receive his righteousness because he died on the cross paying the debt of our death so that we could be restored to God. The blood that he shed covers us so that we are righteous in the eyes of God. We accept that and we walk with God and we are made righteous, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus did and we've accepted it. We've joined him in the waters of baptism and we get to get into heaven on the grace of Jesus. Does that make sense? That's good news. That's good news. That's the gospel. That's the foundation. Jesus is always the foundation of the church. And so as it begins to spread, that's the good news that they're spreading. In a nutshell, not in a completeness, but it's a working definition. So as we are walking through uh, this, I want to ask you a few questions. If we were to contextualize that verse eight into our lives today, I have to ask you the question, where is your Jerusalem? Where's your Jerusalem? And what I mean by that is Jerusalem is the most holy and sacred city for the Jews. It represents home and the center of their Jewish activities. And Jesus told the disciples that you start here, start at home, start at the center of your current world. So what's the center of your current world? Who is it in your life that feels like home? Like when you see them, there's just this sense of belonging and love and they're a part of your inner circle. Who is that? I think I just saw somebody tap the person beside them. It was beautiful. Because maybe the person beside you is home, right? Because it's not really the buildings, it's the people around us. And so what Jesus is saying is that you're gonna start in Jerusalem and you're gonna talk to the people that you know and they understand you and you're gonna tell them the good news. You're gonna expand the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. So what's good news for the people in your life? Like what's good news? How are you gonna tell them about Jesus? What does that look like for you? And then Jesus says, it's not just going to stay in your immediate family or friend group, but no, it has to go beyond that. It has to go to Judea, which is like a wider circle than just those who are directly in contact with you. And so here's what we know about Judea. Jerusalem's in Judea, and, and many of the core values and the structure and everything like that would be shared by the people of Judea. So where is your Judea? Who is your Judea? Those are the people that maybe look like you, talk like you, think like you, have values like you, morals like you. Maybe you work with them. Maybe you see them in the gym in the morning. Uh, you know, that's the group that you're comfortable around. And so if I was to say you were to take the good news to them, what would that look like? If you were to spread the gospel, spread the kingdom of God, and push out into your Judea, who would that be? And what would the good news look like to them? And so then it says, what would it look like uh, to be the good news of Judea? But then where is your Samaria? And this is where things shift a little bit. This is where it gets maybe a little bit harder for some and easier for others. See, the Jews avoided Samaria. They saw them as outcasts and they didn't trust them. Um, they just did not associate with them at all. So in a couple weeks, um, my family is going to Washington, D.C. We're going to take a, a, some vacation time and we're going to go visit my sister and we're going to go see the city of Washington, D.C. And so as I was making arrangements and getting hotels, um, my wife said, now, Ed, like, we're not staying anywhere sketchy, are we? You know what I mean by sketchy, right? Like, it's a place that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. My wife's like, hey, you know, we can spend a little bit more money and not stay in sketchy. 
And I'm like, okay. You know, there's a funny thing about sketchy because sketchy's different depending on who you are, right? So I grew up in Minerva, Ohio. And Minerva is a great, great little community. They love each other. They support each other. And I would feel completely comfortable walking up and down the streets of Minerva at any hour of the day. One day, I asked a good friend of mine to come play basketball with me. And I said, Montel, will you come play basketball in Minerva with me? And Montel told me, brothers don't go to Minerva. Minerva's a little sketchy. You know, and I was like, what? Like, I was almost mortified at that. Like, what do you mean brothers don't go to Minerva? Well, Minerva hasn't always been very friendly to brothers. Right, Montel? And so we had that conversation. It's not always easy to hear that about your conversation, But the reality is there are places that I don't feel comfortable going either. And they're a little sketchy. And the Jews in the days of Jesus would travel completely around Samaria to avoid it because it was sketchy, because they didn't get along. And so when Jesus says, you're going to go from Jerusalem to Judea, I'm sure the Jews were like, sweet, we can do that. But then he says, you're going to go to Samaria and then the rest of the world. And I'm sure there were some of the apostles that are like, hold up, what? That's a little sketchy. Not sure we're going to go there. And you're, what you're going to see as we walk through the book of Acts, there are circumstances that begin to happen in Jerusalem and Judea that push the disciples out. And Jesus is like, no, this is an unstoppable movement of God that you're a part of. And if you won't go willingly, I'm going to shove you out. Because it's mission critical that the gospel goes beyond who you know, who you look like, and who you act like. In two weeks, we're going to have an awesome opportunity to have Mike and Tabby Boyce up on our stage. And they're going to share with you uh, about the mission work that they're doing in Chile. Two people from our community that have taken their family to go to Chile to live in a culture that is unlike what they grew up in. People don't look like them, speak like them, or act like them, but they're pushing the gospel to all ends of the earth. And so we get to have an awesome conversation with them. Uh, They'll be speaking to you guys, and I look forward to, to, to hearing what they have to say. Because it's mission critical that we get outside of our comfort zone and not just think that people who look like us, act like us, and think like us are children of God but it's all people of all nations, of all places on this planet that the gospel message of Jesus needs to go to. So where is your Samaria? Where's the place that you look at and you're like, I don't know if I should go there. But your willingness to go there might show someone how much you actually love them. Your willingness to have conversations with people that you don't maybe understand might reveal to them the love of Christ that's inside of you. What is your Samaria? And what would it look like for you to be good news to them? In John chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says, this. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria, and so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son, to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. At noontime, generally speaking, nobody would be at a well. That's something they would go to in the evening or in the morning because of the heat. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How, w- how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God uh, and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave, 
gave us the well and drank from himself, as did his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't be, get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she said. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. See, in the days of Jesus, this, this woman would have been just pushed to the side ignored, abandoned. And so Jesus is having a conversation that makes no sense contextually. He shouldn't be talking to her, associating with her. But he's, what he's talking about is so deep and so powerful. And in verse 19, she says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming, called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Here's this woman, pushed to the margins, getting water in the middle of the day alone. Jesus comes up to her, a Jewish man. She believes a prophet after some of the things that she says, and he's explaining this to her. And do you know what he does in the end of this? He declares to a Samaritan woman who has had five husbands and is now living with someone that's not his husband, and he makes a declaration that the Messiah has come to her. Not to the Samaritan rulers, not, not to some king, not, not to some wealthy Samaritan. No, no, no. Jesus chooses to announce the arrival of the Messiah to the Samaritan people to a woman that most people would consider a whore. And that's who Jesus chooses to say, I am the Messiah and I want you to announce it. Whew. What in the world? Jesus is unlike anything that I could ever imagine because I would have ran to town square. The Jewish people avoid. They walk around Samaria. Jesus walks right into the center and finds this woman and he reveals to her, if you will only drink the water that I give you, and I'm not talking about physical water, I'm talking about a spiritual water. He says, your body thirsts over and over and over again, and you return time and time again to this well to draw, but there's a water that's deeper. There's a spiritual water that I offer you because I'm the Messiah. I'm the Lord and King. And his language would not have been lost on her. It's this beautiful moment. And so the question that I have for you is, what would it look like for you to be good news to the Samaritan people in your world? What would it look like for you to declare Jesus as Messiah to them. What would it be, look like for you to be good news to the people at the ends of the earth? I look forward to going through the book of Acts and we're not gonna get to be able to cover all of it in eight or nine weeks. It's a pretty big book. But there are some key things that I'm really looking to pulling out of. And here's one of them. The movement of God is absolutely and undeniably unstoppable. It's unstoppable. There's nothing that we can do or say about where God is going. He is going to advance his church. He says to Simon Peter, I'm going to build my church on the rock and not even the gates of hell can stand in front of it, can overtake it, can stop it. We have nothing to fear as we move the kingdom of God forward. We just have people to love. 
We just have people to embrace and to share grace and truth as we advance the kingdom of God. So the question that I have for you, the challenge that I have for you today is these questions. Who is your Jerusalem? Who is your Judea? Who is your Samaria? Samaria? And who is your ends of the earth? And what does it look like for you to push the good news into those regions of your life? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your son Jesus who sets us free from our sin and who is the good news. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that each believer has inside of them guiding and directing, prompting and leading. We thank you for our God, the Father in heaven who sent Jesus, who is the righteous judge. We thank you for the church that you've established on the cornerstone that is Jesus. We thank you that you give us the promise that the church will endure, that it will survive. We thank you that we get to be a part of it, encouraging, uplifting, building each other up, holding each other accountable in grace and in truth. Father, we pray that we will be a gentle tool of love and grace and truth, pushing your kingdom forward in our communities. I thank you for the invention of the internet, that we can tap into that to expand our reach, expand the church's reach. And Lord, I thank you most of all for the sacrifice of Christ who set us free.